Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Rajaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the non-aligned meet that took place in Tehran recently, particularly what happened vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Rajaz, it's very clear that the kind of isolation that the United States and the West sought to impose in Iran did not happen in the non-aligned meet. 120 countries attended, a lot of heads of states went there and even the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon attended when he was told not to by the US. Do you think it's a temporary victory for Iran? Well, um, I hope it's not temporary. Uh, of its kind, yes. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, uh, Iran is now going to be in this position in the non-aligned movement for the next four years. Uh, it's, it's going to be chairing the, the, the non-aligned movement. And it's very interesting that he has taken it, I mean, Iran has taken it over directly from Egypt. What I was thinking uh, very interestingly, um, uh, uh, Prabir is what is now non-aligned movement um, because the atmosphere in which it was born in terms of uh, two great powers and two um, systems of capitalism and socialism and so on and so forth, uh, all of that is gone. So <clears throat> what you then have is that except for a small handful of countries which are not aligned with the United States, all the countries are aligned with the United States. Uh, <clears throat> so conceptually, non-aligned movement has become a forum for the assertion of the rising powers in, call it third world, call it tricontinent or whatever, and whatever margin of autonomy people can assert in relation to the United States. So that is what it has really come down to. And this was in that sense a show of autonomy. Uh, Iran is one of the very few countries, there are three or four in Latin America, you know, uh, which are not aligned with the United States. And for all of these countries which are aligned with the United States to stand up there and assert that one fundamental right that the United States and under the pressure of the United States, even the Security Council in a certain sense, is trying to deny Iran. Uh, <clears throat> they affirmed it resoundingly. Uh, so it is certainly solidarity with Iran, but it's also a certain sort of assertion of autonomy that beyond a certain point, the diktat of the United States yeah, will not and, and the same thing is with Ban Ki-moon. Um, he's an American, um, you know, messenger boy, basically. But given the power of the, um, the, the governments, the, uh, which are the governments of about two-thirds of the planet, uh, it would have been extremely awkward for him to fall under the pressure of the very people who have got him appointed to the position that he holds. So even he had to, in his mousy way, sort of defy the United States and appear there. It's a very important point that what does NAM represent today? Okay. But you know, one of the core points of NAM was not neutrality between the two blocks, but it was decolonization. That's really what brought the NAM together. And do you think that the fact there is a recolonization that is being attempted is one of the reasons that this assertion is being made? In a certain sense, but I think, I think it is much more the slow unraveling of U.S. power, the gradual sort of rise of a number of other countries in the game of global capitalism within itself. So uh, the weakening of the hegemony of the United States. Weakening of the, of the hegemony. Post-1991. Um, uh, yes, and, and, and yeah, and uh, well, uh, certainly, I mean, increasingly so as the, you know, I mean, 40% of the world's uh, product now comes from East Asia. Um, I mean, it's just as simple as that. Um, so uh, the U.S. can be hegemonic in all kinds of ways, supported by its militaries, it's the largest economy in the world, and so on. But there's a slow unraveling of all that. And it is really in relation to that. Um, this I see in relation to 
um, number of countries, um, Brazil, India, um, uh, among um, others, um, making a kind of a coalition for membership in the Security Council. Um, it, it is that kind of assertion of autonomy, the very countries that are very closely aligned with the United States, and yet are saying that um, the global governance cannot be left to, or who want IMF reforms, and so on. So it, it, is, it is part of all of that sort of institutional remaking of the world slowly and gradually at the you know nam had almost faded out for about 20 years 20 25 years absolutely so this is in some sense a comeback and it's also interesting that a lot of the western commentators have said that don't write off nam don't dismiss it like you used to do earlier nam still exists and it's something that's right that's accounted for that's right i mean the the general impression was that g20 g whatever, Group of 77 and so on, had bypassed, you know, had taken over and AM, NAM was over. Now, part of it, I think, is just um, the fact that uh, uh, just procedurally, at this historic juncture, Iran took over the presidentship. <laughs> Historically, so, it became an important point. You know, I mean, because yes. you have <laughs> U.S., so, trying to isolate so, so at this point you uh, you all congregate in Tehran you either say no we are not going to congregate you say no Iran cannot become the etc either uh, Iran's the very idea of Iran sharing um, um, the NAM and holding this meeting in Tehran either you challenge that Again, there, there, there are, I think, other things related to it. I think a number of countries, India included, I think, um, are hurting with the U.S. sanctions against Iran. Uh, we want to import that oil. We have said we will abide by the sanctions. What does that mean? We are going to find other ways. We will reduce the imports. Turkey is paid... Fifth, for 58 tons of gold has gone from Turkey to Iran to pay for oil <laughs> in the last four months. <laughs> you know. So uh, it, 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 it's some of that that you, you can't isolate Iran in that way. Uh, and and, and that's, that's part of what I, I think is happening there. That, that's, of course, visible in what happened with the... Uh, resolutions moved over there, particularly the one in which the countries asserted that Iran has a right to the fuel, complete fuel cycle, so, which is what Absolutely. is being contested in the UN Security yeah. Council. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see that as a, as a huge victory for Iran? It, it's a huge victory, uh, but let me keep, add a footnote to it. You know, if you look at it over the last 10 or 12 years, Iran started by making remarkable concessions. At one point in the late 90s, it offered to cap its enrichment at 5%. At one point, it said, we will just transfer all our uranium out and you give us that. At that point, countries like China became quite worried that Iran was giving up on its rights under the NBT. Uh, so defense of those rights under NPT it's not only a question that involves Iran, it involves any number of countries, this right to enrich. So any number of countries are also saying that if Iran cannot have this right, then in principle no one has this right. Then this right has to be given all over again by the Security Council of the United Nations, something something of that kind. This is always the crux of the issue, sure. that under the NPT, Iran has a right, has a right to fuel to cycle. Yes. And if you want Iran to give up that right, that has yeah. to be done yeah. mutually. It That's cannot right. be done as That's a dictator. Right. That's right. And any number of these countries say, well, tomorrow they might do this to me. And so since Iran does have that right by treaty, we affirm so it's certainly an act of solidarity with Iran, but it's also an act of uh, you know, 
self preservation <laughs> do you think this is going to have any repercussions as far as the un security council sanctions are concerned is it going to make any difference into the regime that is now in place to the security council i don't council? i don't believe that at all um uh, th- that that is a strategic decision that the united states and eu has made together precisely at the time when this is happening uh, canada has uh, um, uh, withdrawn its ambassador and uh, from uh, i mean uh, dismantled its embassy in, uh, in iran and uh, declared the iranian diplomats persona non grata you know precisely at the time when this is happening uh, canada has gone much further than anyone else but this is a this is a strategic position that the western western countries have taken it's also interesting that <coughs> both the united states military as well as israel the security apparatus over there do not want a strike military strike on iran absolutely so yeah. given that do you think the danger of war has receded or do you think after the elections in the united states the danger has come back i have never again? believed that there was any danger of war uh, i think it was rhetorical and finally dempsey speaking for obama basically and the chief of the us chief of staff has just uh, put an end to it uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, Hayden who's the former um, chief of the CIA and who is one of the key advisors for Romney has repeated what Dempsey said so it's a bipartisan position on and this is also what the security apparatus in Israel is saying that absolutely, you cannot have a strike on Iran you see the rhetoric was getting completely uh, out of hand and is Israel whatever it is um in other respects is also among that elite that rules israel a very uh, sort of peculiar kind of country that uh, serving um, uh, heads of the intelligence agencies and uh, armed forces can issue issue statements of that kind uh, and all that i never believed that there was any chance of a war of a strike uh, i always believed that this was a bargaining chip with the united states and obama kept giving israel more and more and finally at some point they just put their foot down to shut him up and i personally believe that it may well be that those key figures of the pres- past and present israeli establishment did it with the us not as when we look at syria Iran did not su- successfully get its position on Syria through the NAM. In fact, it appeared that Syria was isolated and most countries refused to back it. So, do you think that that on that count Iran has lost in the NAM? I think that uh, we should look at the positive things that have happened in the NAM and be happy. For the rest, <laughs> NAM is a right now as i said the coalition of pro american forces if you have qatar and saudi arabia and all of that whether technically members or not and turkey and all of them there um and all the us pressure and all that what what else do you expect uh <clears throat> on syria iran is isolated on the issue of syria um and that isolation came out and uh, in fact uh, it could have come out worse except that uh, the meeting was happening in iran so i think there is some restraint uh, uh, otherwise it could have come out and worse iran did not press the syria issue when well, it found it was not it was isolated i th- i think i but i think uh, there had been diplomatic consultations all over the place uh, and iran knew uh, how isolated it was just before nam there was a meeting of the organization of islamic countries um uh, and that had been there the saudis and the qataris had been quite ugly and uh, iran had sent very high level uh, the highest level uh, delegation possible uh, all the high officials were there uh, and uh, my own sense is that uh, that laid the groundwork for this kind of Uh, thing it uh, at nam nam also asserted the right of palestinians for their own country 
that of course it always has. Again, will it make any difference on the ground or it is just one of the rhetorical positions that NAM has taken in the past? I don't think NAM state. positions make that much of a difference. Um, because Iran is an absolutely burning issue and um, so is Syria, um, uh, these, these kind of things matter, otherwise the rest are routine positions. Uh, so on the whole, NAM a reassertion of, shall we say, the emerging powers in what you said, the third world countries coming together, giving it some kind of new life again. Reassertion of Iran's right to the nuclear fuel cycle. These are the positives. Negatives are on other issues. It continues pretty much as it was. Shall we say uh, that's yes, the sum yes. Total? And, and in, 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 in this day and age of, you know, I mean, you, you, U.S., Hegemony is getting eroded in a long, in the long wave, um, but in the immediate sense, it's a, it's, it, it, uh, it's, 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 it's a gathering of people who are completely united with the United States. And the U.S. still remains the most dominant absolutely, military yeah, power on the earth. Yeah, yeah, military and, and also economic. I mean, economic. You know. Thank you, Ajaz, yeah. for coming to News Click and discussing with us what is a very important landmark revival, hopefully, of NAM as an important player on the global arena, if not in its past form, but at least in a new form. Thank you very Great much. Great pleasure.